and I asked one of the guys about his time on that submarine, and he told me that he had been to Murmansk with that submarine. <laughs> so I, I'd never heard about that. So I asked him, is that something you're allowed to talk about? Well, I don't know. I just tell it everyone is visiting the submarine. <laughs> Welcome to Cold War Conversations. Massive Soviet military forces have invaded the small, non-aligned, sovereign nation of Afghanistan. Poland's military leader, General Jaruzelski, urged the Polish people tonight not to demonstrate on Tuesday, the second anniversary of the founding of the banned trade union, Solidarity. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic for you. During the Cold War, six Dutch submarines secretly gathered intelligence about the Soviet Navy. Only a handful of people outside the Royal Netherlands Navy were aware of these operations, and they were not part of NATO operations. Thanks to our latest supporters, Victor Osprey, Joe Collins, Eric Tielander and Andrew Tyler, who are helping us financially for the price of a cup of coffee or two a month to cover our increasing costs and keep us on the air. They will shortly be the proud owners of a Cold War Conversations coaster. Don't you want one too? Just go to patreon.com slash coldwarpod. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash coldwarpod. For the first time in Deepest Secrecy describes these top secret deployments in detail. On the basis of interviews and archival research, Jamie Caraman reveals how Dutch submarines followed, photographed and listened to Soviet ships unnoticed from the freezing Arctic Ocean to the shallow waters near Egypt. We welcome Jamie Caraman to Cold War Conversations. Welcome to Cold War Conversations, Jamie. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Jamie, you've served in the um, in in the Navy. Is that where your sort of interest in this subject has, has come from? Well, the interest in the subject came from a visit uh, to the Navy days, the Dutch Navy days in 1987. Um, and 10 years later, I joined uh, the Royal Netherlands Navy. Um, but the interest in the subject about submarines that started when I was uh, for um, a report in the with a Dutch uh, submarine uh, during uh, the Dutch uh, submarine uh, command, commanding officer qualifying course. Um, and that was in uh, in Scotland, on the Clyde. Uh, really interesting. And when we flew back with the, the commanding officer of the submarine service, we had a, a technical uh, failure with our uh, airplane where we are still in, the, in Glasgow Airport and we had, to delay, we had a delay of seven hours. So we could talk about a lot of different things, uh, and uh, and also about uh, his Cold War uh, uh, adventures a bit. And I asked him, uh, is it possible to write already some books or, or articles about that time? Mm -hmm. And he said, sure, yeah, that that's all. Uh, it's all in it, it declassified now, but that wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so it was somewhat of a challenge then. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll get onto that in in a moment. Um, now, your book starts in 1968. What what was the Royal Netherlands Navy Submarine Service up to in the early Cold War years and and prior to that point? Well, um, the, the the submarine service uh, suffered great loss, of course, during the Second World War, and um, there was. The, the, the submarine service was on, on paper that survived, but there was almost nothing left. So um, they got some uh, uh, submarines from the UK and from the US and uh, tried to, to recover from that time. Uh, and in the meantime, there were some uh, a lot of uh, difficulties with the, the Dutch colonies in the East, in the, the Dutch East Indies. And, um, but the, the I think only in the late 50s or so, Dutch submarines in, were involved in that for, for quite a short time. Um, after that, 
episode was closed, the Dutch Navy focused more and more on the on NATO and, and the North Atlantic. Uh, and in that time, in the 1960, the new Dutch uh, the designed and Dutch built uh, submarine class three cylinders um, joined the service. So that was with a new submarine, uh, with the new. Well, it was more designed like the what the Dutch Navy wanted. Um, they started a new period. Right, and the, and that's the submarine that I. The type that I went and saw yesterday, the Ton Tonane. Tonane. Yeah, I knew I was going to get that wrong. Um, the Tonane that's at the um, Navy Museum at Den Helder, yeah. um, which was a, a fascinating uh, visit. But uh, we'll probably talk a little bit about that later as well. I think one of the interest things that interested me from your story being British was the close relationship with the British Royal Navy. How did that come about? Well, that started in the Second World War because before that, that was, there was, uh, especially on, on uh, industry level, there was a close cooperation with German industry. Uh, but in the Second World War, obviously, uh, the Dutch Navy, uh, a part of it was based in the, in the, in the UK. Um, also, uh, the submarines, the Dutch submarines were, they joined the, 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 the Royal Navy. Right, so so when Holland was invaded, they they came over to uh, Britain yeah. to with uh, their submarines. So some of the submarines were just taken from the shipyards. There were uh, some of them. I think the O twenty four didn't even have a trial, sea trial. So wow. that was the first time they had to, 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 to when they went to sea. They, they there was the real thing immediately, and they had to go to uh, to the UK, uh, and then they were. They became part of the Supreme Flotilla in uh, most of them in, in Scotland. Uh, so that that was where that began, and a lot of uh, all the, the commanding officers they did the the, the qualifying uh, course for the uh, commanding officer qualifying course for the Royal Navy. Uh, so that's that's where that started. Okay, and the the, the qualifying course is is sort of got a nickname to it hasn't it? it's called the perisher perisher yes course can you just give a little bit more about that course um yeah well that's that started uh, a bit earlier in the in the royal navy because they they wanted to have a better qualified commanding officers and the, the dutch navy didn't have that course so when they came over to the uk they got familiar with that course and that is uh when you're on the commanding officer of a diesel electric su- submarine, especially in that time, you're the only one who gets all the information. You have to handle all this information. You have to make the decision. You're the only one who's looking through the periscope. Um, so you need someone who is, who is trained really well. And not only to, to know how to fight with a submarine, but also how to handle your, the people in, your, in the control room and, and all, the, all the data g- getting in. Um, so and that that course is is quite familiar because it's it's really hard, especially the the final phase of it when um, if you make one mistake you get then then uh, you you that's it you're out you're out you? yeah right. and it's not that when you're out it's when it's told to you then you get a, a, the, a boat will be arranged and you get off the submarine wow it's so that that's, final. that's the end of the career end of your submarine career. Because right. you can't, if you uh, you failed that exam, you're not uh, allowed anymore on a, to, to be a commanding officer on a submarine. So that that's really uh, hard because um, those guys have been in the submarine service for most of the time for around ten years, and that is everything uh, in that ten years is is leading up to that qualifying course, of course, because the uh, uh, that is what that, that's what they want eventually. So it's really high stakes yeah. that you you yeah. come to that. Wow! And and there's more detail in the book. I'm not. We we don't want to reveal everything, but uh, Jamie does go into a little bit more detail as to what that course consists of. Yeah, and that course was is a, is a part, of course, of the this cooperation between the UK and uh, the Netherlands. Um, and I think from that time on until now, you see that. Also in the Dutch submarine service, there is a, a link 
between the, the uh, with the UK's submarine service. Yeah. So so we've forgiven you over Chatham then. Of... Yeah. When was that? 16 something or other? Yeah, 1665. Or yeah, something. famous Dutch victory over the Royal Navy where they sailed up the um the River Medway and uh, sank most of our fleet and took one boat back with them I think at, at at Chatham. But anyway, we're here to talk about Cold War not 1600s. Um so uh, I, under, I understand also that, that some of the um, Dutch submarines were deployed with British squadrons as well, um, like at, at bases like Faz Lane. Can yeah. you just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, there was in the, in the 70s, uh, there was a close cooperation uh, with, the, with the Royal Navy, and that was because the, the Dutch submarine service is obviously based in uh, Den Helder, uh, but there, the, the North Sea in that part is too shallow. So every time they they had to go to their uh, station, uh, there was that was in the North Atlantic. They had to transit there for a few for a day or two. And uh, when you're based in Fast Lane, uh, with a big submarine base with all those facilities, uh, the idea was that was much closer, much better because it's closer to the to your patrol area. Uh, but it's, it's also good to to get more familiar with this cooperation with other submarines. And it was, I think, um, maybe ten years or so that that the Dutch submarines were were that closely cooperating with uh, with the Royal Navy submarines, and uh, there was for one submarine at the time, Dutch submarine at the time, that was the uh, Vesselaine was uh, its home base. Right. Right. Okay. Okay, and because Faz Lane's famous for the nuclear submarines, but we, it's worth just noting here that the Dutch submarines we're talking about are diesel electric um, submarines, so do need uh, snorkeling, I think, to yeah. keep going. Yeah, keep going. I mean, that's not a great term, but anyway, I think you know what I mean. Yeah, that's true. Uh, diesel le- electric submarines. The, the Dutch tried to to, to obtain uh, nuclear submarines as well in the in the sixties and the seventies. First uh, with uh, with uh, Americans, and after that failed with the uh, French. But in the end, it's I think it's better for the Dutch Navy uh, to have the diesel electric submarines, especially because Britain got rid of it of them uh, in the nineties. Uh, after the the Royal Navy turned to nuclear only submarines, um, the Dutch took over the the Paris Accords uh, that started in nineteen ninety four. Uh, so the Dutch uh, have now now have the the commanding officer qualifying course. That's the submarine commanding officer, the submarine commanding course. Um, that since nineteen ninety four, so also Australian uh, submariners and uh, submariners from Singapore, Chile, or everywhere, they go to Den Helder for their. Uh, uh, commanding officer course. Oh, okay. I didn't. I I hadn't realised um, that the Dutch had, had taken over the course, but obviously it makes sense as there's nobody else using. I mean, of uh, so the British and the Americans don't use diesel electric at all. They're all yeah. nuclear. Yeah, nuclear. And power. the French as well. Right. And there's also another another very important part in my book in in that time frame from '68 to to the end of the Cold War. Mm. Um, that a lot of uh, information is needed from the, the Soviet fleet, and they that then a lot of um, um, then a lot of people realize that that is only or maybe better uh, to use sub- these electric submarines. So, um, but maybe you wanted the question. Yeah. No, That's not not necessarily. Later. I mean, I, I'm I'm interested to know the advantages of diesel electric over nuclear because I would have thought nuclear would be better because they'd be quieter. But that's me probably well, no. not understanding the technicalities. But during the Cold War, the the nuclear submarines were not quieter than these these electric submarines. You have, when you have a, a nuclear submarine, you have a lot of bumps uh, and a lot of and there is a lot of noise in the submarine. Um, and when you have a diesel, diesel electric submarine that running, that's running on batteries, not snorkeling, but when it's on batteries, and mm. uh, it's really quiet. Um, in that time, after the Second World War, 
the, the Germans. They had obviously a really uh, big uh, submarine fleet, but then after that Second World War, they are not allowed to to build larger submarines. So only very small submarines designed for the Baltic, the Baltic Sea. So that meant that. Um, the Germans, the Norwegians, and the Swedes have their own submarines for their coastal waters, the Baltic or the coastal waters in the in the North Atlantic. Um, well, the French were in that time frame a bit out of NATO, and uh, so yeah, the, the UK obviously with the their uh, Oberon class mm-hmm. uh, submarines uh, for a large part in the Union Cold War. And um, and in the Mediterranean, there were a lot of other nations with their submarines, but most of them were for coastal operations. Uh, when it appeared that the, the Soviets had anchorages in the Mediterranean, uh, for example, near, uh, near Egypt and uh, Libya and uh, Tunisia, um, then it was very clear that you you need submarines that can travel quite a, a, some distance um, because there were no NATO ports next to them of course in the Mediterranean but not in Egypt uh, so you need a, a submarine that can travel some distance, can stay there for a longer time and also can visit the anchorage right. in a very shallow area Right. Uh, and also you need a, a submarine that's big enough to accommodate People who can uh, handle all the data, data that's coming in and analyze okay. it. Okay, okay. Let Let's come to the the missions then in more detail because I think we're we're now getting into that area. So the Royal Netherlands Navy mission was to gather intelligence on the Soviets. What What intelligence were they trying to get hold of? A lot of intelligence because um, a submarine can get a lot of uh, information about the ships uh, um, and that is about the Soviet about the Soviet fleet um, there are a lot of of course the the submarines have a lot of sensors they can uh, detect or record acoustic signature acoustic noise um, they can also have a look through the periscope and record it with a videotape that was uh, used I think um, the first time I, I read about that was in the, during a patrol in the in the early seventies. Um, they can record the, the uh, data that's emitted by the signals that are emitted by radar. Mm-hmm. Um, and the point is that the submarine can do that for a long time and gather all, all this this information simultaneously. So not only a bit uh, acoustic signature, uh, acoustic noise, but also uh, the, the 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 radar image and the, the image of the of the of the ships, and they can you can combine it so you have a complete fingerprint of this of this ship, because every radar every radar and every uh, ship has its own uh, signature. Because you have a lot of pumps and, uh, and uh, generators, mm. and they emit generally the same noise. But if you if you analyze that, then you see that you have a lot of different uh, um, uh, things in it. So you could identify the type of submarine yeah. by well, not only the type. That's the interesting thing: the type, but also if you if you're analyzing really well, you can even an- analyze. The exact what is the, the, the you can you can differentiate the exact submarine or ship because I mean I've I've heard of stories where they can tell whether one of the cylinders is cracked or something or yeah. and it, it it is that level of detail is it yeah so Jonesy on Hunt for Red October that uh, is is quite well based on facts then um yeah but that's what they did was. Um, uh, they they used a, 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 a special device as a frequency analyzing sonar, and um, so that was not on, on on just by hearing it. Yeah, 
Okay, sorry, I, I couldn't avoid Hunt for Red October, one of my favourite films. Well, but Okay, so um, so they're trying to take photographs of Soviet ships. They're um, listening to the sound and radar, radio waves emitted from from these ships. I think I I read that, they're, that the, the Russians were potentially quite clever. I guess this could have happened by accident, but they were using the same engines in their trawlers that they used in some of the submarines. Yeah. And so the, the the acoustic signature could be quite similar there. Yeah, that's true. But you have a different... Uh, the acoustic signature of that engine is the same, but then you have all the noise, emitted noise by the, the machinery that, that's not um, on the sound absorbing material and... Uh, uh, you have a different screw, so that that's mm. a different propeller. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, is it possible to detect any submarine, or can a submarine actually go completely silent and not be heard at all? You mean in that time frame? In or in, in that time frame, yes. Um, of course, when the submarine is. Um, uh, it depends, of course, on how your sonar or how how good your sensors are. Yeah. What the the, the, the how good um, the, your team is, your mm. sonar operators are. Um, and when a submarine is operated very well, and it's 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 also when you're lucky and it sits uh, in an um, um, below the temperature layer, then it's really hard to detect the submarine. Right. Or maybe, for example, in the Baltic Sea, that it's quite common to to bottom the submarine on the on the seabed, right? Turn off all the uh, machinery, yeah. And then it's really quiet. Okay. The the reason I ask is I interviewed a Canadian anti-submarine warfare uh, specialist who worked with the Royal Canadian Air Force, and he reckoned that the the, the British Polaris and Trident submarines they could detect them. They knew where they were despite the fact that the, the British government say they're completely invisible, and I'm just trying to work out. I don't know about that. Uh, but there, there were nuclear submarines, of course. Um, and I can imagine that when you have when you have a nuclear submarine and uh, the, an MPA is dropping sonar buoys uh, in that time frame, that maybe you can, you can hear them. Um, but it depends, depends on... On, like I said, on the all the, the all the circumstances of yeah. the the capability, the operator, the temperature of the seawater, loads of other variables. By the sound of it, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, can we talk about just a few of the missions, just to give listeners a flavour of what you've got in your your book, because it is it is packed with many missions. But I think one one of the ones that I quite like was the. Um, the uh, Russian trawler that was off Malin Head that was, uh, I think it's called an AGI, which is Auxiliary General Intelligence. Intelligence. Yeah. Hey, you see, I've, I've done notes as well here. Now, th- this one was a really ad- ad- amusing story because they, uh, they were apparently monitoring this trawler and they detected that it was moving closer to the British coast every time there was a football match on so that they could watch it on, on TV. No. Yeah, that's one of the Dutch submarines uh, was operating in that area uh, in UK waters because it was based in the fast lane, and also, of course, the, the Royal Navy submarines were operating there. But whenever there was, uh, they needed the, the Dutch submarine that was uh, then that was sent to that patrol area, and the, that's a very famous uh, uh, the the Melon Head AGI. It's very famous in that time. Um, it was there to get uh, intelligence about uh, the, the 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 Royal Navy SSBNs, the nuclear submarines with ballistic missiles, mm-hmm. and also the American ones. And but it was not only gathering intelligence, but it was also harassing them sometimes. Um, but they 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 liked football because uh, I spoke to one of the commanding officers that that. Actually, saw them watching football matches. Um, what through his periscope? Through his periscope. Brilliant. Yeah, 
there was a green light uh, lighting up in the in the in the crew area and that's what you get when you're you're just there uh, a few a few minutes or seconds or a few hours w- watching uh, such a trawler with uh, with an airplane or with another ship and uh, then you have only a, a, mom- a moment or a few uh, a snapshot mm. of, of their behavior but when you're there for days or some weeks and you you know all the the routines and eventually he, he knew exactly what time they had uh, they did the morning exercises and the, the, all the routines the same uh, captain also told me that he was he, he did he did that the same in the, in the mediterranean and he saw uh, the the crew the soviet crew line up on that destroyer he was watching uh, it was in the anchorage every hour at eight o'clock and they all watched they looked at the same time at the same direction of course and then he passed with his periscope the other side and he could take pictures brilliant so he knew they were looking in the wrong direction so well, he, 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 they were just lined up right and and yeah he knew that he was he was not he gonna be detected he was no. unlikely to be detected <laughs> yeah and that is what you also want to know. You want to know what is the behavior of of, your, of this uh, possible opponent, because when when you know that on ev- at twelve o'clock they they have uh, a new watch coming up, um, that's not what you're going to see because they are inside and in inside the control room or in inside the ops room. But you can you can uh, record that when you see the, the change of the radar uh, when it's uh, emitting. There are some differences in the uh, references or the... The frequencies. The or, frequencies or yeah. some other things because that's what they do when you... That's, that's what every radar operator does when he's there in, in, in starting his watch. He's adjusting his seat, he's adjusting his earphones and he's adjusting his uh, his radar. Yeah, and that's what you see. If you see that every every day at twelve o'clock, do you know then? Okay, that's the moment. Then you uh, that they're not really ready for, ready for attack. Right, that is fascinating, fascinating stuff. Um, how secret were were these operations? They are still very secret. So why are we talking about them now? <laughs> Yeah, why are we talking about it now and why I wrote a book about it? Um, that is because some parts of it, a lot of, uh, they, they're, that, that's really history. Mm-hmm. We're talking about submarines that they, that don't exist anymore or, or are part of a museum, uh, tactics that they're in the history books. Um, and some other things that are very, that are very obvious. And, and, we're talking about, and we we can talk about it because in the Dutch National Archives, um, there were the captain's logs of all the Dutch submarines, and that was obviously a mistake. Um, but every submarine or every ship has a, a captain's log, ship's log, and uh, every six hour. The, the the crew or the one of the officers wrote down the, mm-hmm. all the the things that happened with the uh, with the submarine or uh, in that watch in the past six hours. So, um, but it was there's known that it was open source. So they had when it was closed twenty five years later, it would be in the archives. So that was not it was not allowed to write down. Um, sensitive parts sensitive uh, information um, but and at that time it is really hard to to know exactly what is still secret in 25 in 25 years and so they wrote down what they thought it was it was open it was not that sensitive because the the next to the to that ship's log they had the patrol report and that was the really secret stuff so uh, all the results of the of the patrol uh what they did the what exact. ships they encountered and 
And sometimes they had the ship's log for some special uh, for a patrol. And then they use stamps and put on uh, secret or uh, NL eyes only. But when you do that on a on a document that is not secret, you can put on um, uh, many stamps you want, but it is still not secret. So after 25 years, it went as well to the National Archives. And when I started, I visited my, my the book actually the the first thing I did was of course the the, the talk with the commanding officer submarine service in Glasgow at mm-hmm. Glasgow Airport, um, but I think one year later I went to the Tonang the Naval Museum, and with still with that that information in my head, and uh, I asked uh, it was it was uh, it was exactly the same the windy. Atmosphere, windy, rainy day like you uh, had yesterday. Yeah, the joyous Dutch weather I had yesterday. Yeah. So it was there was no one at the museum. There was no one at the at the supery, except for the, the 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 personnel working there. And and I asked one of the guys about his time on that supery, and he told me that he had been to Murmansk with that supery. Okay, <laughs> so I got really I, I'd never heard about that, and. Um, so I asked him, is it something you're allowed to talk about? Well, I don't know. I just tell it everyone is visiting the submarine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Then so I'd time, call that open source then. <laughs> yeah. At that time I thought, well, I have to write it I have to write it down. I have to do something with it. So I started to interview with uh, I started to interview with one of the guys, uh, uh one of the submarine veterans. And he told me about a lot of information about that uh, about that that time frame, uh, but I, he couldn't remember a lot of details. So the next thing I did was I called to the the history the department of the of the armed forces in the mm-hmm. Netherlands, and I asked them uh, where can I find those re- patrol uh, patrol reports. And then they laughed, of course. They said, well, those are still very secret, and you're not. We don't know even where they are. Even 30 years after they were, or more than 30 more. years. Than that, 50 than, years. Yeah. So, um, okay. And then the, the historians have spoken. They, they told me, go to the National Archives. There you will find the ship's logs. But there's nothing in it. But every historian was was re- repeating that, and if mm. everyone is saying there's nothing interesting in those ship's logs, then no one is, of course, having a look in it. And I was there for for another reason at the National Archives, and I asked one of those ship's logs, and it was just looking in the, and suddenly I saw some s- short information, sort of snippets of of a patrol. So then I decided to. Um, digitize all the 150 uh, ship's logs, 50,000 pages. Uh, it took me one year to do that. Really, that quick? <laughs> yeah, I could, I could do. Yeah, I was really trained after after to to to, to do that really fast. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, and it, it was it was also really strange because. The uh, part of the, the area when you can uh, look in all those um, in the archives mm-hmm. uh, that is for secret uh, material, and there's also uh, one guy of the, the, the national archives ne- next to that table and is watching that you're not taking pictures and only you're only allowed to write something down. So the first time I went there with the with the ship's logs, I went to that table, and he sent me away. Because he said that's not a secret uh, document, so you have to go to the public part. And he said, if you are having a camera, you can also take pictures of it. So I thought, well, if this is not secret, what is the information on that table? Yeah, yeah. And so, but that was a, that was a mistake because I, when I combined all this information with all the, the there were also crew lists in it. Um. And some some ships like were there already for twenty five years, so I am sure I was not the the first one to see that. I, I'm for sure the, the 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 Russian embassy had their trainees started <laughs> <laughs> for 
for years. So that that was um okay, so I I, I digitized that and I analyzed all the information and I and I found 60 uh, patrols in that area. Right. Uh but that is because it was open source. So that's one that's one part. Uh they accidentally it was open source and uh another thing is that the sub the submariners the cold war submariners uh, are not seen uh, as uh, veterans they're not in the, in, in the netherlands they're not uh, recognized as veterans because they were not on an official mission it was just the government says they were only on exercises that is because these operations were so secret that they're not recognized so and that is in the beginning they accepted that, but now after all those uh, all all those years, and uh, their 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 requests have been turned turned down many times, they're a little bit, um, and they're turning older, of course. Yeah. So a lot of guys said to me, "Okay, now I'm willing to talk about this because because we have to talk, we have to tell people what we did, and not only ex- having ex- doing exercises." Or just waiting mm. in port, but we did a lot of things that were really dangerous and really important. Um, and if we don't get a, a we, we're not getting a, a veteran status because they're not invited to the National Veteran Day. That's just shocking. Yeah, I'm. I'm well, yeah, it's really sad. That is sad. Yeah. I mean, when you read the book and you realize the dangers of of what they were actually doing. I mean, they were as almost in combat, or, yeah. you know, that, well, they were in danger of being sunk by Soviet ships if they got too close or got in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. That's. So that's, that, yeah. So that's why a lot of guys were really willing to tell uh, more details about it. And they also said that this is the first time I'm telling this story to uh, someone who's not in the submarine service. Even their wives or their and their kids, they didn't know about it, and so their family. The first time they they heard about they read about it, it was in my book, and sometimes fifty years after the, that mission. Uh, and like you said, there was sometimes there were some times that it was, it was really dangerous. Mm. Uh, they did a lot of uh, underwater looks. Uh, Can you just define what yeah. an underwater look is? Okay, that's uh, um, if a submarine wants to know more about the ship, you can obviously gather the information from uh, some distance. Mm-hmm. But a lot of sometimes you want to see the, the 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 exact layout of the propeller and um, and the bottom of the the ship. So the only thing, the only possible way to do that when you're when the the, the ship is at sea, is with the submarine to go underneath the, the ship, or underneath the submarine. It's even more dangerous, but that, this was also done, uh, and take a picture of film to complete on the side of that ship. And was that film taken through the periscope, yeah. or you can't really see where you're going in a submarine easily, or is that? You, because I mean, this must be really precision work yeah. to try and not hit the target that you're trying to examine. Yeah. So you have to, you, you need an extremely well trained crew. You have to trim your boat, your submarine, really well. So it has to be uh, on the same depth constantly. Because if you the the, the distance between the, the the top of the periscope and the the, the ship is maybe uh, two meters or so, wow. or sometimes it's five. Depends on the visibility in the in, of the water, but uh, sometimes it's t- even two meters. And if if that ship is only sailing for four knots, five knots, it's it's hard to get to to keep the submarine because you need that sort of depth. like neutral buoyancy yeah. to to stop it rising yeah. too high or even going too low, so you can't see anything. Yeah. Wow. Um, and were so there that, any any Collisions. I mean, did did they actually hit hit things? Not with the Dutch uh, Dutch submarines. No, no, there were no accidents. There was um, good parachute training, obviously. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, there were some some accidents, but that was only and were well, not during patrols, but it was uh, well, fires, of course, and uh, not on the. Uh, problems, but no, uh, no collisions with uh, with Soviet uh, ships. Right, right. And you you mentioned about the the operations in the Mediterranean and sort of what what were the Soviets up to in the in the Mediterranean? Well, the Mediterranean Sea is uh, very important for the for the Soviets. Um, <clears throat> they uh, there isn't they have no no port there. But they want to 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 have some influence there. So, and well, this this started a long time ago. I think in the in the nineteenth century, when um, the, the 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 Russians wanted to go there, and they had to, to they had a lot of wars and difficulties with uh, with with Turkey about uh, a passage from the uh, Black Sea to the Mediterranean, but. In the end, they want some influence, a lot of influence in the Mediterranean Sea. So um, they did a lot of a lot of things. For example, uh, uh, delivering weaponry to uh, to yeah. So they were su- supporting a number of states yeah. in that area. Uh, and one of the other things is they wanted uh, ports. And for sometimes they were they had some access to it or they had they had their own port but then they had to leave uh, they also did try to have one in uh, in uh, Albania uh, and then they they had to leave after a couple of years uh, but in the in the in the 70s in the 80s they, they were allowed to to stay and to have an anchorage near uh, Solom uh, that's on the border of Egypt and uh, Libya, and the Gulf of uh, Hamamet. And mm-hmm. uh, there's another different uh, anchorage, and there they they had they had their their floating base actually. So they they had the, you have of course you had in the north part of the Mediterranean, the NATO ports with uh, the NATO sixth fleet, uh, the, the 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 US sixth fleet. Mm-hmm. And all the NATO uh, squadrons, um, and they had their own squadron in the Mediterranean, and with floating bases, so submarine uh, tenders and repair uh, ships. So these were like large ships. supply ships that would just more, oh, yeah. more in this bay, yeah. and then supply the submarines and and war warships yeah. um, that were in the area. Yeah, and and uh, submarine could. Um, was was tied next to was to to that submarine tender. The crew could uh, get on board the submarine tender, take some rest, and um, so that was the the, the main uh, reason why they had their anchorage. Right, and that is an important thing because in the in the sixties and the seventies, the first part of the seventies, the main focus. Of the Dutch submarines was in the North Atlantic, but when you have an, a diesel electric submarine uh, and, you, and 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 you have to wait for a Soviet ship to pass by, and if you see that on your horizon, you can only sail for uh, let's say uh, ten knots or so, or uh, if you want to 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 stay really quiet, you have to to sail for five or six knots. Then you're you're never going to be to, be, to get close to that that ship, um, so actually there were mobile mines, uh, and that and you had to wait for hour, for for days and weeks to get lucky, and then one of the the, the, the ships to get to, to get close. Mm-hmm. Um, it's even it's it's easier for that sub that's these electric submarines to 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 go hunt for their opponents instead wait to wait for them. And when you, they, the, the Soviets had their anchorage, it's easier for, for the diesel electric submarines to get to, to go there and actually visit the, the anchorage. Right. And that is what happened. They, for, to take pictures and to, to gather all this information, sometimes they had to go through the anchorage. Um, and, and had to look out that they didn't got, 
hit by the, the the cables that were running down to the sea bottom. So they were right in the middle of the anchorage, going through periscope up, presumably, or or no. not taking photos. Well, one of the stories is um, it was in eighty three with uh, with the Dutch submarine that uh, the the commanding officer had to take pictures of a Juliet class submarine. And that was on the other side of the anchorage. So you had to go through the, the whole anchorage. But the, the visibility is the, is very good in the Mediterranean. Mm. So if you're on periscope depth, that's 17 meters for that submarine, um, you can easily be seen. Even your periscope is down. If it's up, it's it's much easier. There, there, there are a lot of guys, Soviets, uh, smoking a cigarette or just walking outside to do some maintenance. So that was really dangerous. He he stayed on uh, fifty uh, meters because he he did some reconnaissance on, on the, the the days before, so he knew exactly where all the ships were positioned, where the the cables were running down, the anchor cables. Mm. And he listened because all those cables were making some noise. And he listened on the sonar. And he, you're plotting that really well. You know where you have, where the cable is. So uh, if there is a cable staying in, in the same direction, staying there when you're moving, then you know it's on collision course. So mm-hmm. if all the cables are moving on your plot, then there is nothing uh, going on. Then that's safe. So that's what he did. And then at the right time, he went up to periscope depth, raised his periscope, took s- some pictures of the of the Juliet, and uh, went away. Wow. And is, is there any evidence the Soviets knew that this was going on or not? Um, no, there is no evidence because there were some... Um, every time there was a submarine there in that area, uh, of course... It was uh, the the whole area was monitored, and um, there were some incidents known that if you, if there was an MP an, an airplane flying close to the anchorage or a ship, the the Soviets radioed that to to their headquarters, and they changed sometimes their frequency of the radar, so they turned off some systems. And that had, didn't happen during that submarine, submarine operations. So, you, of course, that does not mean that that was completely unknown, but it also means that what well, that was the conclusion that they uh, they were not detected at that moment. Okay, okay. Now it it sounds like there's possibly loads of other stories out there that you don't necessarily know about. Um, do you think those are likely to get re- released at some point? And is there going to be an in deepest secrecy too? I think there will there will be an in deepest secrecy too. Yeah, um, but I think I have the the most important stories uh, of Dutch Cold War submarine operations in this book. I've interviewed thirty guys, thirty former submariners. Uh, that did a lot of uh, uh, many missions because I had to I had the crew list I knew exactly who did the, most of the missions so I picked out the right um, uh, submariners and uh, I don't think there is there, there are still great stories to tell about that uh, that time frame that I don't know yeah uh, but after that time there was uh, sub- Dutch submarines were involved in 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 the in the during operation sharp guard nato sharp guard in the, in the, after the, the Kosovo war and the, the the Yugoslavia crisis in that time frame they were also involved in that uh, in in the mediterranean right so so there are further stories to tell there a lot of stories yeah great be looking forward to that um now what surprised me was these missions were not technically part of nato operations no can you tell me why that would be because you you'd imagine that that these should have been part of nato operations well the um, what the, the submarines wanted to what, what, what why they were sent there to the soviets was to gather information and to store all this information in a database um but the 
the user of the database is of course the or the intelligence services and um because it was a dutch submarine it was not they they didn't want to share it immediately with all nato members um every the the, the, the intelligence services work like um they have they they used to trade their information and not share that immediately especially in that time um so that's why it were not nato operations and there's also one one thing i heard about that um what the experiences about nato was that it was not really that uh um Sometimes there was some information that that leaked out. Yeah, it wasn't secure. No. The the information that that's what I'd imagined is that obviously the wider you share information, the more chance that your uh, adversaries are going to uh, find out about that. Yeah, there, there was some example like um, uh, when a submarine is sent to a is sailing, uh, then they use a sub note, and they they have to sail in this in the in the virtual box, uh, so everyone knows that in that area you're not uh, allowed with your submarine otherwise you have a collision and that sub that's that that sub note is transmitted through all nato some part of nato um, one of the commanding officers uh, who had uh, was uh, co- uh, commanding officer of of, of uh, a submarine in the 70s told me that when they got the sub note that they um they were leaving Den Helder and going to the south. Then there was always a trawler, an AGI on the south. Mm-hmm. And um, so what did, what they did after that happened quite a few times. Uh, when they they went to the south, and then they had to stop now that they were going to the to the Atlantic to uh, Madeira. But then they secretly went to the to the to, uh, Strait of Gibraltar. So, and then they never saw an AGI. So that means that that somehow the Soviets were reading those subnotes, right? And that was a that, so when you share it in a in a large community, then there are more risks that that leaks out, and you don't have something to trade. Yeah, yeah, and so the the Dutch were then trading this information for. Uh, I don't know, for to get stuff from NATO. No, not from NATO, but presumably with other NATO members. But this is the intelligence uh, part of this of the story. Yeah. So, it's, so th- this is the stuff that, um, well, you can't really cover. No. Okay, we better leave it there then. Um. So. Um, we mentioned right at the start that uh, you've written a fictional book based on these um, submarine operations. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I did some uh, thirty interviews or more with uh, with former submariners, and some interviews took two and a half hours. <clears throat> so there is a lot of there was a lot of information and a lot of stories, really interesting stories and. After a, um, I heard some of the stories. I, I thought, well, this is it would be great to use for for a book, a new a fiction book. And that book is uh, so so. It's based on on a few of those stories, but I I changed that, of course, a different time and a different uh, submarines. And um, this book is about um, a commanding officer who uh, is. Is a bit in 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 problem in a problem because there he had an incident in the year before, but uh, uh, he he's on the only submarine was operation which is operational at that time, with the with the, with the trained crew and the, the submarine is uh, is is okay. So he is sent out to do a, a, to go for on a patrol in the north, um, but it's a bit that patrol is boring because there isn't. It's just a vast area, and there is nothing to hear. Um, and the crew has to to do to do some some things to, to uh, 
for recreation. And one of the things is uh, the the ship's newspaper, uh, and one of the guys who was uh, writing the ship's newspaper, um, he he wants to to um, um, to do to make it a great newspaper and to have some to get some credits and uh, to be successful and to be seen because he's new on that on that submarine. Um, and when he sees, gets some, some, some news about Dutch frigates that are in, in Mediterranean and they are heading back to Den Helder, he changes that news and writes down a story about that they're not going to Den Helder, but to the Black Sea for a freedom of navigation operation. And, uh, while he's, he's covering that fake news story, obviously, and that things getting out of hand, uh, during that that operation, and um, well, then uh, don't give it all away. No. <laughs> it's getting really interesting. Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, we'll be providing links to both the non-fiction book in deepest secrecy and also the fiction book, which I think is called Orca. Yeah. Well, Jamie, thank you for um, all all of that. That's a, a great amount of information and will have certainly have whetted people's appetites to uh, read the book further because I can assure readers there is a load more um, interesting operational detail in the book. Um, now, normally with my author guests, we do have what I call a quick fire round, which is a few fun questions. Well, I hope you'll find these fun anyway, Jamie. <laughs> What is your favourite Cold War themed or Cold War era film? That is uh, A Hunt for Red October. <laughs> a man after my own heart. Okay, tell me why. Uh, because also because of the the music, the the whole the whole story, uh, the the characters. And and also uh, after I after I saw the, the making of and all the how the crew prepared themselves to to do that role, and um, uh, the, the, yeah, mm-hmm. after that I was really uh, even more a fan. But, of that but you being a submarine expert must look at that film and say, no, they didn't do it like that, or that's not possible, or things like that. Surely. Yeah. Yeah, that's true, of course, but it's it's fiction, and uh, that's that's what you get when you you have to tell the, that complete story in let's say two hours or so. Yeah, and 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 reach a big audience. Uh, of course, you have you have it. It won't be a, that realistic. It, it is not a documentary. No, it it is good entertainment. Yeah, if you can excuse Sean Connery's attempt at <laughs> Russian. If you were making a film about the Cold War, what piece of music would be the soundtrack? Well, the the soundtrack of the Hunt for October is great. Yeah, and the, the soundtrack of Crimson Tide is is great. As Another well. great it's, submarine it's, movie. Yeah, I'd, yeah, Gene Hackman and Denzel Washington. Yeah, I think. Yeah, and the soundtrack by Hans Zimmer. Yeah, yeah, that, that's really terrific. Yeah, I haven't watched that in a while. Actually, I'll have to dig that that one out. That is a that is a good film. Have you ever seen the film The Bedford Incident with Richard Widmark, black and white Cold War movie with a frigate chasing a Russian submarine? No, I, I, I recommend that. Okay. It's good. It's good. It's set early Cold War. It's sort of like fifties, early sixties, um, but it pops up on the TV every once in a while. Bedford Incident. And I recommend that to listeners as well. Um, so my next question would be, if you could invite three personalities from the Cold War, living or dead, to uh, have a few drinks with, who would they be and what questions would you ask? It doesn't have to be three. It could be two. It could be one. Well, um, when I did the, uh, the research for my book, I uh really happy and really lucky that a lot of important former submariners uh, were still alive and I could interview them. And so I had really great interviews, but there's only one 
uh, who was uh, who passed away uh, a few years before I started with research, and he had he was part of the he was commanding officer of the submarine service when they started with the first patrol. Um, and it's it's really too bad that because they're, 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 they they those who are so secret there's no there are no documents um, still and so he was the one in the end who, who knew what what was arranged what was what the the details was where they the the commanding officers get and um, so that that guy I would have yeah. Uh, ask a lot of questions so there are stories from the early cold war that are just completely unknown and undocumented then is that the period you're talking about there yeah well they're not completely unknown because i, I there's still some submariners who were in that who, who were on for example on that submarine and that in the first mission but uh, there were most of them were junior junior submariners or uh, junior officers at the time or um, uh, or even the commanding officer of that submarine doesn't know exactly what what happened before that before he got that 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 order to go to sail there and to do that operation. Right. So so this guy that you were talking about would have known the whole picture. Yeah. Wow. Well, this there might be an archive somewhere that you've not necessarily laid your hands on. Hopefully, yeah. Now I think I probably know the answer to this one, but. Are there books or a book or websites that you would particularly recommend for anyone interested in Cold War submarine operations? Now, obviously, there's your own esteemed publications, but but what else is there out there? Well, um, the first book I read about this topic was uh, Blind Man's Bluff, and really great classic book on this uh, topic. Yeah, um, yeah no, absolutely. Another book was... Um, Published, I think, 2015, The Silent Deep by Peter Hennessy and James Jinks. Um, really great, great book. A lot of uh, stories, and and I used it uh, quite a few times for my uh, for my research. Right, and that's Royal Navy focused, isn't it? Yeah, that's that's the whole the history of the Royal Navy submarine service from 1945 until. Uh, it's quite a hefty tone. Um... Jamie's got it here on his uh, kitchen table. That looks a good one. I'll have to add that to my birthday list. Yeah, well, it's 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 really and it, the letters are also the font. The letter font is uh, quite small. Ooh, looks like about eight hundred pages. That <laughs> yeah. when I le- when I leafed to the back right. there, but uh, it looks all good stuff. Yeah, it's really it, it's it's really intriguing. It's really interesting, and it's not. Uh, no, I I I was. Uh, that is a great book. Yeah, easy read as well. Okay, and is any other books you'd recommend? Yeah, another one is uh, "Hunter Killers" by uh, Ian uh, Ballantyne, and that's um, a bit about the same the same stories, the same uh, idea that I had with my book. But these are these are a lot of uh, uh, this is also of course about the Royal Navy submarine service. But also with another a lot of news news new stories and new um, uh, adventures and that I didn't know about. Uh, so I really uh, recommend those uh, those books. Yeah, that one that one looks good. It's subtitled "The Dramatic Untold Story of the Royal Navy's Most Secret Service." So I will be adding links to all of those books in the show notes. Are there any websites that you can recommend? There's obviously yours. Which I can't remember the uh, the link for. Well, the the, the name is uh, marineschepen.nl. I'm so glad you said that, not me. Um, I'll add links to that in but, the uh, show notes. Yeah, but well. I started also with my uh, English language uh, website. It's still a bit uh, hard, but that's uh, naviesworldwide.com, um, and that's that's mostly about uh, the current topics about submarines and the Dutch submarine replacement and the new mine hunt, uh, mine countermeasure vessels. So Right. So it keeps going. The story keeps going. The then. story keeps going, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jamie, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you on Cold War Conversations. I hope you've, 
you've enjoyed the ride. It hasn't been too bad. Yeah, I enjoyed it very much. Well, that's it for this episode. However, there's photos of my visit to the Royal Netherlands Navy Museum at Den Helder and links to Jamie's book in the show notes, which are at coldwarconversations.com slash the word episode and the number 70. Don't forget, you can support us and get a Cold War Conversations coaster at patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Cold War pod. If you like what you're hearing in the podcast, you can really help us by leaving reviews on iTunes, Stitcher, our Facebook page, or with your favourite podcast provider. This really helps raise our profile and get new guests on the show. If you can't wait for the next episode, do visit our Facebook discussion group where our guests and listeners, just like you, continue the Cold War conversation. Just search for Cold War Conversations on Facebook. We're also on Twitter at Cold War Pod and Instagram at Cold War Conversations. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye.